Meditation is largely training in how to handle pleasure and pain. We need this training because we tend to abuse these things. When pain comes along, we try to push it away. When pleasure comes, we like to wallow in it. And pushing away and wallowing are not really all that productive of any genuine happiness, any genuine well-being. Because when you push the pain away, you don't get to know it. You don't get to understand it. And as a result, you never really get away from it. No matter how hard you push, it keeps coming back, coming back. It's like having a delinquent child. You don't like him in the house, and so you push him out of the house, and of course more trouble comes to you because of what your child has done when it's out of the house. The problem of our abuse of pleasure is a different kind of problem. We want to have it all the time, and yet we don't look after it. We just wallow in it. And then it turns into something else. And John Sawat had an image for this. He said it's like a water buffalo in Thailand. Water buffaloes like to drink nice, clean water. But when they get a nice puddle of clean water, what do they do? They lie in it. As he said, they piss in it. They move around and get it all muddy. And then they don't have the clean, clear water they wanted to lie in. In other words, the pleasure that you gain when you meditate can be used for developing an even higher pleasure as a genuine nourishment for the mind to keep you going, to keep your work well nourished. And yet as soon as we gain a little bit of pleasure, we don't want to use it as a basis for any kind of work in the meditation. We just want to wallow in it. The mind begins to drift away, and then you've destroyed your meditation because you've abused the pleasure. So it's important that you understand how to approach both pleasure and pain in the meditation. That way you get genuine benefits from them, because they're both noble truths. When pain arises, think of it, this is the first noble truth. When the pleasure arises from being settled in the breath, yeah, that's part of the fourth noble truth, part of the path. But we don't use it as a path, we just lie in it. And you know what happens when you lie down in paths? If it's a forest path, you're bound to be run over by an elephant or whatever, and that large animal uses the path. If it's a paved road, you get run over by cars. So the path is to be followed, to be developed. That's what you do with the pleasure. You learn how to develop it. As for the pain, you want to comprehend it. That means in the beginning, say a pain arises in the knee, a pain arises in your back. You've got to strengthen the mind, give it a sense of ease and well-being. This is where the pleasure from the meditation can show one of its uses. So you try to develop a sense of ease with the breath. Once you've got that sense of ease going, you don't wallow in it. As the Buddha says, once there's a sense of pleasure, rapture, that come from getting the mind secluded from its unskillful thinking. You allow that sense of pleasure and rapture to permeate the entire body, to suffuse the entire body. Now that requires a little work. It requires a fair amount of alertness. How do you allow that pleasure to spread without squeezing it out of existence? You have to learn how to develop just the right touch. This is one way of discovering whether your meditation is too clamped down. Because if you clamp down on the object of the meditation, it's not going to produce the sense of ease you want. Or if you try to force it through the body, it's just going to make things worse. So how do you allow it to spread? Just pose that question in the mind and see what answers you can come up with. 
and you want it to fill the whole body, as the Buddha said. It's like having a pile of flour or power. In his image, it's a pile of bath powder. In those days, they would take bath powder and then they would knead water into this pile of bath powder to make a lump of almost like dough that you would then rub over your body. And you have to allow it to suffuse or allow the water to suffuse through the powder in such a way that it every part of the ball of bath powder is saturated with water, but it doesn't drip. So how do you saturate the whole body with pleasure? That requires a lot of alertness, being alert to the whole body. This is why the Buddha says in the beginning of his breath and meditation instructions, you start with watching when the breath is long and watching when it's short. And then you try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out, so that when the pleasure arises you can allow it to spread through the whole body. And this is very different from wallowing in the pleasure. When you wallow in the pleasure, as they say in Thai, you close your ears and close your eyes. And you're not taking care of the pleasure, you're not doing any work at all. And because you're not doing any work, the effort that was required to keep that pleasure going disappears. In the meantime, you've probably drifted off someplace. So what you need to do is establish a very large frame of reference, the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out. This is where you become more sensitive to the breath energies in the body, the flow of energy down the back. Sometimes it's up the back, down the legs. Sometimes it's up the legs. It really varies from person to person. And you find that conceiving of the breath energy in different ways helps to modulate the breathing so that it feels good. And then when it feels good in one spot, you think of it spreading out in whichever way is the most comfortable to fill the whole body. So that you're surrounded with breath energy behind you, in front of you, above you, below you. The whole body is saturated with a sense of ease and well-being, the fullness of rapture. Now you want to do this early on in the meditation, because allowing the breath energy helps to eliminate a lot of the potentials for different pains in the body. The pains that come from focusing down too hard or for sitting in an unbalanced posture. The pains that come when you try to close off certain energies in the body so you can focus more strongly on the spot you want to go to. You want to avoid that problem by thinking whole body all from the very beginning all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. That in and of itself can help eliminate a lot of pains. When I was first meditating, I want to soak around. We'd have an hour and a half sits. And I'd usually find that after the first half an hour or so, there'd be a pains in my leg. But then I realized that up to that point, I hadn't been doing much work in spreading the breath, spreading the pleasure from the breathing. So as a way of heading them off beforehand, that's the first thing I started doing right from the very beginning of the hour and a half session. Thinking of the whole body from the very beginning, think of the breath flowing from the very beginning. Don't think of how much time you're going to be sitting here. Think of what you've got work to do right now. So that when there is a sense of ease in the breathing, and the breathing does become a lot more easy when you're thinking of the whole body, because you begin to get sensitive to areas where you tensed up to breathe in or tensed up to push the breath out. So you can allow those parts to relax. And then you do your best to maintain that sense of full body awareness. It does have a tendency to shrink, so you have to fight that. So that's the work that you do in the pleasure. When the pleasure arises, you have something to do with it. This also helps when the breath gets more and more refined, because it will come to a point where it's going to stop. Not because you forced it to stop, but simply because all the breath energies in the body help to feed one another. 
the oxygen coming in and out of the pores is enough to keep the blood well oxygenated. So the body's instinctive reading of the level of oxygen in the blood allows the breath to grow more and more still. When it's still, you're really going to need this full body awareness not to lose track of things. So that's how you make proper use of the pleasure. Whatever sense of ease comes from the breath, you allow it to suffuse the body. Again, you don't force it. Just think of everything opening up to allow it to come in. This puts you in a really good position if any pains come up. Because the duty with regard to pain is not to push it away, not to make it go away. The duty with regard to pain, remember, is to comprehend it. And the first thing you've got to realize is whenever there's any pain or stress, there are two kinds. There's the simple pain or stress that comes from the three characteristics. In other words, anything that's fabricated, like the body or the mind, any of the khandas or the aggregates, is going to have some stress simply by the fact that it's fabricated. So that's part of the natural order of things. But there's a deeper stress and deeper pain that comes from craving. That's stress and pain in the Four Noble Truths. Now that's not necessary. In John Lee's phrasing, the pains in the body, those are natural pains. The pains of craving are unnatural. We create them when we don't have to. So that's what you want to learn how to see. Why is it that you create these kinds of pains? Where is the misunderstanding? That's well, because we like to feed on our pleasures, but when you're feeding on your pleasures, you're going to run into pains as well, and you start feeding on the pain, and that's unpleasant. So you want to watch, you know, why is the mind feeding on these things? You want to develop a sense of what the Buddha calls nibbida which can be translated as disenchantment, but also translated as distaste for these things. In other words, you want to stop feeding. That's different from pushing them away. When you push them away, you don't really understand them. Where's the difference between the, the natural pain in the body and the unnecessary suffering or stress in the mind? So you have to learn how to watch these things, and this is why that sense of ease and well-being and from the meditation, from the concentration, is an important tool, an important helpmate in the path, because it gives you the sense of well-being that you don't necessarily have to feel threatened by the pain. It's there, but you've got something else you can focus on. And one of the things you can do, once you've got this full body awareness going, a sense of the breath energy throughout the whole body, allow it to spread through the pain. So the pain isn't a wall, say, in your leg or in your back or in your hip. It's porous, too, and the breath comes first. You find that there's a subconscious reaction when there's a pain. You tend to close that part of the body off when you breathe. It gets squeezed off, so it doesn't participate in the breath. Of course, that makes things worse. You allow the pain to restrict your breath energy. And what you want to do is have a concept of the breath energy permeating the pain even before it does permeate the pain. Hold that possibility in mind. Keep that foremost. So you're not just reacting to the pain, but you're actually more proactive in helping to direct the breath energy. This can help loosen up the pain. And again, helps you feel less threatened by it. And sometimes the pain will go away. But if it doesn't go away, then you can watch. Well, what does the pain do as you're breathing through it? How does it move? How does it change? What are the little pain sensations? Are they all pain sensations? Or are you, were you labeling them in ignorance? Where is the worst spot of the pain? How bad is it? Is it too bad, so bad that you can't stand it? Usually when you get interested in the pain like this, instead of just simply being on the receiving end, when you get more proactive. You find that the pain is a lot more tolerable. Because it's not just you sitting there drinking in the pain or eating up the pain. 
you are now probing, chasing the pain down from the position of being with the breath. And you can start seeing distinctions. What's the difference between the physical pain and the mental pain? What's the distinction between the physical pain and the body? What's the distinction between the mental pain and your awareness of the mental pain? We tend to glom these things together, but that's because we don't understand them. We've been pushing them away, and so we push them into one glom, or big glob. But as you allow them to open up, you begin to see these things are different. The sensations of the body are earth, wind, water, and fire. Pain is something other than those four things. So when it seems like the pain, say, has taken over your knee, try to fare it out. Okay, which are the pain sensations and which are the knee sensations? Focus first on the issue. Okay, which are the earth sensations, which are the fire sensations, the water sensations, and the breath sensations in the knee? So you can sort them out and you see exactly what is left to actually be the pain. You see, they are different things. Again, they don't have to be clawed together. This is where thinking of the breath as primary, as prior to the pain, as opposed to something that can be squeezed out by the pain, is very helpful. Earth, water, wind, and fire were there first. The pain came later. Keep that in mind helps you separate the pain out from the, the leg. And as you're engaging in this analysis, again, you're feeling less and less threatened by the pain, less and less on the receiving end, and more in a position of simply probing to understand. Then you apply the same principle with the mind and the mental pain. There's the awareness, and there's the awareness of the pain, and then there's the pain itself. Try to sort those things out. And again, which came first? The awareness was first. The pain is visiting. Don't let the pain take priority. Keep your awareness, the perception of your awareness, in the position of priority. And when you do this, you're learning how to use both pleasure and pain in the right way. You're not abusing the fact that you have pleasure. You're not abusing the pain. You're getting training and developing what the Buddha said are the, the duties of the Four Noble Truths. You're developing the path and you're comprehending the pain to the point where you develop dispassion for it. It seems strange to have the idea that we're passionate for our pain, but we do allow the mind to get colored by the pain. There's pain in the body, it becomes anguish in the mind. If there's something that has the mind upset, that creates even more anguish. That's a kind of passion, a kind of coloring of the mind, and it's not necessary. So we've got to learn new habits in the way we approach pleasure and pain. But the pleasure isn't simply an end in and of itself, and the pain isn't pushed away as an enemy. You put the pleasure to use so you can comprehend the pain. And it's only when you comprehend the pain that you can go beyond it. It's only when you put the pleasure to use that you can go beyond it. As John Lee said, that becomes the point where you stop bothering them, because you've got something better than conditioned pleasures, got something better than pain. That's when everyone has their freedom. The pain has its freedom, the pleasure has its freedom, you have your freedom. So try to keep these points in mind.